Okay. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Happy Friday. Uh, thank you guys for taking the time to join us for our second webinar. My name is Amanda Reinhart, and I'm a forecaster with the National Hurricane Center and the Tropical Anal Analysis and Forecast Branch. Uh, today's seminar is on wind and wave prediction, which will be given by Dr. Chris Lancy, who is the branch chief of TAFB. And if you have any questions, uh, please ask them in the chat section. And at the end, Chris will provide a link where you can get his talk and Mike Brennan's talk from yesterday. So, take it away, Chris. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda. I appreciate it. Um, all right. So let's go ahead and get started. So again, my name is Chris Lancy. Um, that is my real name. It just so happens that I work here at the National Hurricane Center and I'm the chief of our marine forecasters. And today we're going to talk about wind and wave predictions for the Blue Water Mariner. That is folks that go offshore uh, more than 60 nautical miles. Um, so just want to make sure everybody knows the context of our organization. Um, so we are the Tropical Analysis Forecast Branch. We have 18 forecasters here full time, 365 days a year. And we're part of the National Hurricane Center. The National Hurricane Center is part, is one of eight national centers for environmental prediction. NSEP is part of the National Weather Service. National Weather Service is part of NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and NOAA is part of the Department of Commerce. So what that means is that we're federal employees. Uh, we're all working together to uh, keep people safe and to help uh, uh, the nation's economy. So with that preamble, what we're gonna talk to you today about is pretty in-depth look about what we do as wind and wave forecasters here at the National Hurricane Center. So who, what is TAFB? Uh, why are marine forecasts important, if that's not obvious to you? Uh, how do we observe winds and waves? Uh, what are TAFB's key products and their interpretation? And who is TAFB's key governmental partner? We have one. I think you can probably guess who it is. And then a three possible new products and services that we may want to uh, provide to the, the, uh, the marine community in the future. So with that, I think it's important to talk about our mission. What do we do here? Uh, so we have 18 marine forecasters, all 18 are meteorologists. And what we do, to paraphrase our mission statement there, <clears throat> is we provide wind and wave forecasts and warnings over the tropical and subtropical oceans so that mariners can stay safe and they can safeguard their, their cargo, whether their cargo is oil or goods uh, or for cruise ships, people. So that's what we do 365 days a year. So why are marine forecasts important? Well, uh, here's an example of why they are important and what uh, kind of went really badly very quickly. Uh, this was a cruise ship several years ago, uh, rounding the uh, southern end of uh, South America and they're in the Southern Oceans, and the Southern Oceans are notorious for extremely strong winds and very large waves. And um, they, the captain and crew made a choice of, instead of going with the waves, they turned and they started getting broadsided, and they didn't tell anybody. Um, so this uh, uh, video has no audio, and it's a fixed camera. So the camera's not moving, but you'll see what happens. Uh, and unfortunately, the captain and crew didn't let people know that there could be issues. So you can see everything's normal. Bartender working there, a maitre d' cooks in the kitchen, a couple passengers sitting there, and all of a sudden the boat starts rocking back and forth because of 30 to 40 foot waves. Uh, instead, instead of going with the waves, they turn and they started getting broadsided. So all of a sudden the ship starts rocking back and forth, and you can see how um, very dangerous this gets very quickly. Uh, and so uh, this is not typical for cruises. Uh, most captain and crew do an excellent job of keeping people safe, but this is an example of where things can go wrong very quickly uh, if adequate precautions are not taken, including uh, monitoring the forecasts to get an area to stay safe. So we provide forecasts to the mariners as part of the International Maritime Organization. So we're a US organization, part of the National Weather Service, as I explained already, but there is part of the United Nations that focuses on marine interests, the International Maritime Organization. And so every square inch or square centimeter 
of the global oceans, there is a country that provides marine forecasts and warnings free of charge. So for example, if you were uh, on a cruise ship uh, in uh, North Atlantic, then uh, Britain is responsible for providing those wind and wave forecasts for the captain and crew. So specifically, the United States has some of these global responsibilities. So our colleagues at College Park, Maryland, at the Ocean Prediction Center, have the high latitudes of the Pacific, high latitudes of the Atlantic. Uh, our colleagues, fortunate enough to work in uh, Hawaii, uh, forecast for the Central Pacific. And here at the Miami National Hurricane Center, NAFP, Tropical Analysis Forecast Branch, we forecast for the East Pacific, Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean Sea, West Atlantic. It looks small, but it's 10 million nautical square miles. It's amazing how big an area it is. And this is prime hurricane territory. Uh, so our responsibilities are busy all year round. Winter storms during the uh, uh, winter months and then hurricanes during uh, June to November. And it turns out there's hundreds of ships out there. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, but to me it was a surprise when I took this position a couple of years ago. How many ships are there on a, on a daily basis? This is a snapshot of how many ships there are, and each color represents different type of ship. So red indicates uh, oil tankers, uh, blue indicates cruise ships, green indicate cargo ships, uh, blue indicates uh, tugboats, uh, and the uh, light purple are giant personal yachts. Um, by the way, if anyone has a giant personal yacht, I'm volunteering to be their personal meteorologist. But we're trying to keep all these ships safe and these people on board. We can't make decisions for them about ship routing, but we wanna make sure they have the best forecast information so they can do the, uh, provide, uh, take care of their mission and keep people safe as well. Um, but again, it's just amazing how many ships there are, whether it's on the Western side of North America and Central America, going through the Panama Canal, uh, up to the United States and the Gulf of Mexico, even all these ships that are going on the Mississippi River hundreds of ships every day in our area of responsibility. So one aspect for measuring storms um, and measuring the conditions is though, are those ships. And there is a program through the WMO, World Meteorological Organization, that they recruit ships to provide measurements, observations of winds and waves so that we can see them as forecasters and know what the conditions are for those ships and also for those measurements to get into the computer models so that they can make better forecasts. So it's a win-win situation there. You know, if mariners benefit when they provide their observations because the forecasts get better, and we benefit as forecasters because we can actually see what's going on over the open ocean. Um, so if you're not in the VOS program and you're one of the giant ships crossing the Atlantic, Caribbean Gulf, or the East Pacific, please consider joining. Uh, it turns out we actually have very few Voss ships, only about 5% of the global shipping, um, shipping uh, ships are on the Voss. And so that's a plea for folks to, to join up so we can get more measurements. In addition to ships, we do have buoys. The National Data Buoy Center for the United States operates several buoys over the uh, Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean Sea, West Atlantic. And so we get continuous wind and wave and pressure information. Uh, we also get uh, remote sense information. So these colored wind barbs are actually from a radar in space called a scatterometer. Turns out the United States doesn't own any scatterometers right now, but fortunately our colleagues at the European Space Agency operate three scatterometers we get access to, and India has a scatterometer that we're using as well. So that helps fill in the gaps between the ships and the buoys. Uh, moreover, these colored numbers are wave heights from space, another radar called an altimeter that gives you a line of waves, and it can give you precise measurements that are accurate to the, about a half foot. Still amazing to me that we can get wind wave information from space so, so accurately. In addition to that, another set of tools are the satellites that give us the imagery. So recently, the United States uh, launched a couple new geostationary satellites that watch the same patch of ocean and land all the time. And it gives us pictures as much as once a minute and spatial resolution less than a mile. It's incredible the detail that we can see over the entire Western hemisphere with one satellite. Uh, so it's a big expense that NASA 
used to launch the satellites and NOAA operates the satellites so we can get the imagery every day. Uh, in addition to that, there are other satellites called low earth orbiting satellites that give us microwave pictures so they can actually see through the thin cirrus, the high level clouds, to understand what the convective structure is. So the combination of the geostationary satellites with the visible and the infrared imagery and the, the uh, polar orbiting satellites with the microwave imagery really helps us to get a three-dimensional picture of what's going on over the open ocean every day. And additionally, we have computer models that we access. So for example, on the left side are winds over the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean Sea, West Atlantic. And we typically use the global forecast system from the US National Weather Service. But we also use the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, or ECMWF. Key for us is having global winds that we can take a look at and, and merge those together where we come up with our best estimate of what the current conditions are as well over for the next several days. So in addition to global weather models that provide wind information, we also have wave models. So there's a Wave Watch 3 model that the Weather Service runs that takes those winds from the global weather models and then drives an ocean model to come up with not only wind waves that are generated locally, but also swell event. And so these combinations of uh, weather models and wave models are the bread and butter for us as forecasters to put together. It's worth pointing out, especially during hurricane season, we will make sure to have what the hurricane specialists, as what Mike Brennan discussed yesterday, incorporated into our wind grids so that we can run a wave model. So we actually run a local ocean wave model here to give us what the conditions are over our 10 million nautical square miles. Uh, and so we have consistent winds and waves with the products we produce. Another key aspect of the tools that we have at our tool set uh, are the, the uh, workstations. And right now we're embarking on uh, moving toward the Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System, second generation, or AWIPS-2, that the entire rest of the weather service is using. And so there's a picture here of one of our forecasters, Carl McElroy, uh, as he was dealing with Hurricane Dorian last year. So that's critical. So our forecasters have to have a workstation that has the satellite pictures. It's got the observations from ships and from space. It also has to have the numerical models, that is the winds, and the wave information all in one package so that we can efficiently put together our forecasts and then provide the text and graphical and gridded products. Speaking of which, we'll switch now from tools that we use on a daily basis to what are some of the products and services that we produce here at the National Hurricane Center Tropical Analysis Forecast Branch. One of which is really an internal product for the hurricane specialists. So we interrogate the satellite pictures and the, uh, the imagery uh, every six hours to provide an estimate of where is the center of the storm and how strong is it. And we use a technique, 40 year old technique called Dvorak that is a pattern recognition approach and it uses expert judgment from a human analyst to figure out how strong the strongest winds are. In this pic uh, particular case is shows when Katrina was named um, back in 2005 and Rita was named in 2005. And that's generally when the thunderstorms wrap halfway around the center of the storm. We call that five tenths banding and a log 10 spiral. And so it's the human analyst that actually outperforms the best estimate by a computer model uh, called the advanced Dvorak technique. So we're gonna continue doing this. And again, this is a key um, product mainly for the hurricane specialists. So as we <coughs> move to the other products, we have three desks uh, operational every day at the Hurricane Center at TAF B. One is the surface analyst, and one is the Atlantic Marine Forecaster, and the other is the Pacific Marine Forecaster. And so the surface desk, one of the key products that is provided is the unified surface analysis. And so this gives an opportunity to put together a weather map every six hours of the entire Western Hemisphere. Uh, we do this patch here in the tropics. Uh, the Ocean Prediction Center does the high latitudes of the oceans. Uh, Honolulu does the Central Pacific. And our colleagues at the Weather Prediction Center does the United States and Canada uh, minus Florida. Apparently, they don't think Florida is in the United States. 
And if you've lived here in Florida long enough, you probably agree. So it's a pretty important product because before you can forecast, you really have to understand what's going on now. What are the features that are causing the winds, the waves, or the rainfall? So we'll take a look. What was the surface map today? And so this is the uh, map that Evelyn Rivera did today. And it shows, for example, Tropical Storm Fay right off the mid-Atlantic coast, uh, weak high pressure over the Gulf of Mexico, a couple of tropical waves uh, over the tropical Atlantic. And so it shows a typical kind of conditions that we do for a day-to-day -day basis on, on, on the surface analysis. So uh, another key product that is done by the Surface Desk is the tropical weather discussion. So this is a companion text product that talks about current conditions that matches up with the, uh, the unified surface analysis. It also has forecast conditions through the next five days, where basically we're using the synopses from our offshore zone text products and putting it all here. So it's a great one-stop shop for descriptions of the wind and wave features. So the remainder of this is gonna focus on products from our marine desk. So we have one marine desk for the Pacific Ocean, one marine desk for the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf. And the products we provide are a combination of X products that are decades uh, old in format, but still critical for a lot of mariners. Graphical products that are pro provided both by marine facts as well as uh, internet-based. And then uh, the last several years, gridded information where you get a high resolution grids of winds and waves and warnings. So you might wonder, well, radio facts, that sounds like that's fairly old technology. Well, it, it turns out it's really expensive for ships to have high-speed internet over the open ocean. And indeed, many cargo ships uh, today and other ships do not have internet access on board. So we have customers that range from cruise ship where everybody on board has their high-speed computer and, and internet on their phone to, for example, a, a 50-foot uh, Bubba Gump shrimp boat that may go over the Gulf of Mexico for five days and has no internet connectivity. So there are a variety of ways that ships can access that. So this summarizes uh, all of them that are available. Uh, and so if you want more information, you can go to this website uh, that describes how to access these different uh, technologies, depending on what you might have on your ship. Uh, when you're closer to shore, there's more options available. So for example, VHF radio or NOAA weather radio. Further offshore, then you might be able to get Navtex, which is a medium range transmission provided by the US Coast Guard of our products. Further offshore, um, ships that are 500 tons or greater are required to have um, the global marine distress and safety system um, network where they can access via either in Marsat or coming very soon, Iridium, so they can access the text products provide them the, the warnings and the, uh, the basics of what's going on. Ones that uh, want also can get uh, products specifically by FTP mail. Uh, that's a low bandwidth approach. And also Marine Composite Page, which we've debuted a, a couple years ago, and I'll show more detail of that. So there are a variety of ways to get access to forecasts over the open ocean, um, but it's a lot more difficult than, uh, than being on land and having instant internet access all the time. <clears throat> so one of the key things that we do is a database of winds and waves and warnings all the time. It starts from now and it goes out through the next six days. So we provide that in a, uh, a spatial resolution of 10 kilometers, so that's about six nautical miles, and it goes out uh, three hourly increments out to three days and then six hourly out to six days. And what we provide are, are winds and gusts at 10 meters, and then significant wave heights, as well as any hazards or any warnings that we issue. So we have the responsibility of providing gale warnings, for example, during the winter time, and in tropical storm and hurricane warnings during the summertime. Um, just go back, I think it's important to point out, the way we do things now, our business approach, is everything comes out of our grids. So our graphical products, our text products, fall out of our grids of our winds and waves. So we need to ensure that our gridded database, which is available for folks to download and view if you have uh, high-speed internet access, um, and that helps provide all of our remaining products. So 
Some of the key ones we provide, as I mentioned, uh, the high seas is one that's mandated through the International Maritime Organization. Uh, and it's kind of a broad brush one, doesn't give a lot of details, but it does indicate any warnings, uh, for example, as well as uh, for winter gales, as well as tropical storms or hurricanes. It's issued four times a day, and we have it both Atlantic Basin and East Pacific Basin. Another text product is the offshore zones. So this is providing more detail. It goes out to five days and it uh, gives warnings, but also has more uh, detailed information uh, twice a day uh, of what's going on. So we can take a quick look of what's going on in the Atlantic today with our high seas, our offshore zones. So for example, in the central Gulf of Mexico, uh, Jorge Aguirre, one of our forecasters, is forecasting very pleasant conditions, which is typical during the summertime. So this nice little GUI, depending on where you're interested in going, provides the exact forecast for the next five days conditions there. So we also provide an offshore zones for the East Pacific, especially for the shipping lane from Southern California, past Central America and the Panama Canal and out to the Galapagos Islands. Uh, this is actually brand new, uh, well, relatively brand new. So we debuted it uh, April 16th last year. Uh, so again, to provide more services for the marine community because hundreds of ships are out there every day of 500 tons or greater. Another text product that we provide is uh, the Navtex. Um, Coast Guard actually did a survey several months ago to see, does anybody still use Navtex, which is a medium range transmitter? Uh, turns out there are dozens and dozens of ships that still use Navtex, a medium range uh, receiver to get this uh, forecast information that's focused on uh, the ports in the United States, um, both the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf of Mexico. Another option is voice broadcast. And so this is using a high frequency transmitter. Again, the Coast Guard is, is providing the service with our products so people can receive them as well. Uh, and, in similar kind of scale as our offshore zones. So switching to graphical products, uh, traditionally the way that ships have gotten it is be radio fax. So it's a high frequency transmitter. Again, the Coast Guard provides that transmission, one in Hawaii, one in, uh, in uh, Point Reyes and uh, the Atlantic coast and one in uh, New Orleans, Gulf of Mexico. So we have these as radio fax, but we also have them on our website as well. So one that we provide is the uh, surface progs. And so this is for both the Atlantic products and the Pacific products. It goes one day, two day, three day, and it's updated twice a day. And so this shows the features that are of interest. It also has the isobars showing where the constant pressure surfaces are. And so this gives a nice overview of what may be causing the winds and the waves. We also have uh, an assessment twice a day of how high are the waves across the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf or the East Pacific? And what direction are those waves coming from? Whether they're wind waves or they're swell that are the dominant waves. And so this is provided twice a day um, for both products. Forecasts of winds and waves are also provided in these wind wave graphics. And so it shows the wind barbs and wave heights in feet. Uh, that, uh, and it's provided uh, one day, two day, and three days out and it's updated twice a day, and then one for the Caribbean, Atlantic, and West Gulf, uh, and one for the East Pacific. One note is that currently we're doing all of our wave height forecasts in feet, but we've been hearing from the marine community, international marine community, that for the open ocean, meters is more of a accepted practice. So we're exploring whether to provide uh, meters as well, or maybe switch to meters. But currently, everything we do is in feet. And then lastly, a wave periodicity and direction. So it's a two day and a three day forecast issued twice a day. Um, and there's a black and white version for the radio fax and a colored version for our website and what direction the waves are coming from and what the periodicity. Uh, for the non-mariners, the worst conditions are very large waves hitting you sideways in very short periods. That's bad news and that's what you try to avoid and that's what that uh, cruise ship did not avoid. Another graphic that's provided during the winter time is a two-day snapshot of any warnings that are in place. 
And so this is also one for the Atlantic Basin, one for the Pacific Basin, and it's updated four times a day to show where any warnings. In this particular case, uh, uh, back in, uh, in March, there was a warning in the Gulf of Tehuantepec, which is very common to have winter gales there. We call them Tehuantepecers. And uh, because the winds squirt across the uh, Chavela Pass between the Sierra Madre Mountains and cause a downslope wind event, and you can get all the way to 50, sometimes even 60 knots of wind, completely clear skies. During the hurricane season, we turn that product off and we turn on a danger graphic. So Mike Brennan yesterday talked about the wind speed probabilities. So we use that to inform this uh, marine product for the Mariners. And what it shows is in the dark hatching where there's at least a 50% chance of gale force winds or tropical storm force winds, they're the same, uh, conditions. So that's where most likely you will have tropical storm conditions. But also a 5% chance. So it depends on how risk averse you are as a mariner. Do you want to just know where the most likely location of tropical storm winds are, or do you want to make sure you avoid them at all costs? So you can see the 5% chance is a larger area than the 50% chance. So those are the main products. And as we're evolving technology wise for the mariners, Eventually, there are going to be a point, and maybe it's a generation from now, where all large vessels over the open ocean will have high-speed internet access with redundancy. We're not there yet. And so we're going to continue to provide the radio fax and the nav techs products, at least for the next few years. Uh, however, for the ships that do have low bandwidth internet, we have one option for folks to take a look at and use. So on the, on the right side, it shows wind barbs. And this was a case back in January for a gale event behind a cold front. And the colors indicate the wave heights. And so anything yellow is at least a 10-foot wave. Anything in red is about a 20-foot wave. So pretty nasty conditions just east of Florida. On the left side, it shows our forecast progs, as well as um, color-coded information that match the high seas text forecast. So in this case, on the left side is red is where that gale condition is. That's at least 35 knots. Then blue would be eight foot seas or greater. Uh, yellow would be the 25 knots or greater. And the hatch would be both uh, eight foot seas or more as, as well as 25 knots or more. So let's see what we got today. What are conditions going on today? Again, going right to that website that's available at the National Hurricane Center. We can toggle and put on the barbs. We can toggle and put on the features. And let's put on the, uh, the wave heights too. And so this is conditions as of 12Z this morning. So that'd be 8 a.m. Uh, Eastern daylight time. So you can see there's very light winds over everywhere except for the Caribbean, just north of Columbia. There tends to be a, a enhancement of the trade winds there. We have a couple of weak tropical waves and there's that high I'd mentioned earlier. And so our marine composite page then takes our grids and our forecast prog, progs and overlays them. So I'm going through forward every 12 hours into the future. And you can see the progression of the wind and wave conditions. Very nice right now over the open ocean. And then at days four and five, we don't have surface progs, but we do have our wind and, and wave grids that go out through five days. I did wanna just briefly show the East Pacific because we do have an active, uh, system, uh, Christina, that I think just became a hurricane or very close to it. And so shows a little bit more of the active conditions. That was from 12Z this morning. And then this is for tonight. And you can see the colors where the wave heights are very high in conjunction with where the, the, the tropical storm or hurricane winds are occurring. And then uh, by three days, the system moves well offshore. So again, that's an example of our marine composite page that if you have low bandwidth internet available on your ship, you can access this because those are very small GIF images that we're making available. Here's an example for the specific for one of those Tawana Pecker events. Uh, again, on the right side, it shows the wind barbs and color shows the wave heights. And in this case, it had a peak seas of about 25 to 30 feet. So gigantic waves just south of Southeast Mexico. On the left side, it shows the corresponding conditions. And in red was the gales, 
And in that little spot of green is storm event. Storm is 48 knots or greater. Um, so a pretty pronounced event that occurred uh, this January. So those are the products. I did want to talk about some of the services. And often we don't know as much what our mariners are, are seeing. Again, I think I mentioned earlier, only 5% of all the ships out there are sending us information. So most of the time, we don't know what they're experiencing. And as I showed earlier, there's dozens and dozens of ships out there um, over the open ocean. So this picture, a typical day, whole bunch in the Gulf of Mexico, whole bunch in the West Atlantic, a whole bunch just between Florida and the Bahamas as well. But when we do have hurricane warnings in place, for example, it's very gratifying to see the mariners taking very uh, prudent hazardous weather avoidance. So here is an example of before Hurricane Dorian and then what happened during Hurricane Dorian. So you can see all of those ships that were between Florida and the Bahamas scattered and all the ships in the forecast track scattered too. Uh, in fact, there was only one ship, uh, an oil tanker, that got a little close, uh, but I don't think they ended up having problems. So it's really wonderful to see mariners seeing our forecast and taking action to avoid the worst conditions of the winds and the waves. On the left side is a quote from our partners at the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, so Captain Eric Smith at District 7 here in Miami, uh, just uh, reiterating his support for the products and services we provide. So that does lead to the Coast Guard. That is our one core governmental partner. Uh, we, uh, we work with them um, almost uh, on a daily basis during the hurricane season when there's threats to either their search and rescue regions over the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean Sea, West Atlantic, or East Pacific, or if they have an incident, perhaps there's a man overboard or an oil spill, or you know, uh, they're doing a, Law, uh, legal issues, uh, you know, looking for drug runners, perhaps, or there's a, an aircraft that, that, that crashed somewhere in the ocean, or there's a ship missing. Whatever the Coast Guard is dealing with, whether it's District 7 in Miami, District 8 in New Orleans, District 11 in California, or District 14 in Honolulu, we can provide them assistance. And so one way we do that is we provide spot forecasts, that is exact conditions of winds and waves for the next uh, couple days, so they can better plan their search and rescue uh, so that they can keep their personnel safe um, in their life-saving mission itself. Last year, the majority of those uh, spot forecasts were due to the Bourbon Road sinking. Uh, the Bourbon Road is a Luxembourg flagged transoceanic tug, about 160 feet long. And for some unknown reason, it went right into the middle of Hurricane Lorenzo when it was a Category 4. Uh, they called for help, the ship sank, and it turned out that there was a, a couple hurricane hunters that were um, operating out of the Lesser Antilles, and they were the first ones there to do search and rescue uh, before the U.S. Coast Guard and the French Navy were able to assist with the search and rescue. Turns out that uh, three mariners were rescued aboard a lifeboat, um, but a Several others uh, died at sea. Um, we do have a really neat write-up on that if you want to check that out later that we uh, published on our blog a couple months ago. But it's this kind of support that we provide the, the first responders, in this case the Coast Guard, whether it's the U.S. Coast Guard or sometimes the French Navy, uh, to, to help mariners over the open ocean. Another aspect is decision support services where we're providing live briefings. And again, it's mainly during the hurricane season when there is a hurricane threat to uh, any in their search and rescue area or a tropical storm threat at the coastal areas uh, that we beef up our support and provide live briefings for either District 7 here in Miami or District 8 in New Orleans. And as you may imagine, the bulk of those briefings were for Hurricane Dorian, where Coast Guard, U.S. Coast Guard had to help the Royal Bahamian Defense Force because the Bahamas were completely overwhelmed by what Hurricane Dorian did. And so those men and women in the Coast Guard ended up saving the lives of many people in the Bahamas um, to assist uh, that other country. So those are some of the products and services we provide. One thing that we're trying to provide uh, a little more regularly now is information by social media. And uh, we've beefed up our Twitter 
Uh, we try to tweet uh, on a regular basis now, either current conditions or more background information about climatology, as well as our warnings are auto-tweeted. So if there is a gale warning in the winter or there is a hurricane warning in the summer, those are tweeted automatically. And so if you want immediate confirmation about a warning over the Atlantic, Caribbean, Gulf of Mexico, or East Pacific, you can uh, sign up to our Twitter page. And I've got that at the very end. So another aspect to what we do is that we've got uh, potential for new products and services into the future. And I'm gonna talk about three of them, just to throw it out there. And if there's anyone that wants to follow up by sending me an email, if, if this is uh, something that you would like to see, I would love to hear from you because we wanna make sure our new products and services are something that the Mariners can use. Not something that we like, but something that you all might be able to make use of. Uh, so the first of which is that we're hearing from these big shipping companies that they need to plan their shipping route more than three days out. They're looking five or even seven days out. And right now our surface progs only go to 72 hours, three days. So potential for us to go to five days or maybe even seven days. So would that be of interest? And, and we've heard from some uh, mariners that, that going out to five days or even seven days both for radio facts as well as for uh, internet-based products, uh, that that might be useful. Uh, another aspect is that when we provide ocean wave forecasts, whether it's in a text product, whether it's in graphics, or whether it's in our grids, it's always exact or what we call deterministic. And whenever you do an exact deterministic forecast, it's always wrong. Sometimes it's wrong by a little bit, sometimes it's wrong by, by Quite a bit more and so we're in the weather service as a whole we're trying to provide more probabilistic information so instead of an exact forecast what are what are the uncertainties what are some of the bounds and yesterday um, mike brennan talked about wind speed probabilities for tropical storms and hurricanes and uh, as an example this is a hurricane bill from a few years ago and the exact track is shown in that solid line and then every time we run an advisory there's a thousand member Monte Carlo simulation, a mathematical approach, where you get a thousand plausible but realistic uh, tracks and peak winds and sizes. And essentially we count up for those thousand members how often you reach different thresholds, whether it's tropical storm or that's gales or uh, 50 knots or hurricane force. And so we can get wind speed probabilities. And so we want to use the same approach, the same technology to provide wave height probabilities. So instead of just saying, all right, with um, Tropical Storm Faye, it's gonna be 20 foot waves. Instead, can we provide different likelihoods and can we provide that spatially? So here's a, a mock of, of what it might look like. So we do know that there's different thresholds for different ships. So giant cargo ships, oil tankers, they really don't care in, until the waves get really large. So perhaps 20 or 24 feet. Whereas other ships, for example, cruise ships, they care when it's even six or eight foot waves, because unlike oil tankers or cargo ships, cruise ships have cargo that tweet, and they don't want their cargo tweeting bad things because they're in giant waves. So if we do provide wave height probabilities, we want to make sure that it's user specified. Cargo ships would want a real large threshold versus cruise ships that maybe we want to see eight foot probabilities. And so this is a, a mock-up of what it might look like for that, but it would be user specified what you care about, what wave heights to, does your ship care about. So in this case, this is Hurricane Joaquin and what it could look like for chance of 24 foot waves going from a near certainty in purple to 5% in green. So if you, how do you use this? So if you're designing your ship route, where are your ships gonna go to avoid the most dangerous conditions? Perhaps you just wanna know, well, where's the most likely location of those high seas over the next five days? In that case, you use 50% or higher. That's where the most likely location of those 24 foot waves are gonna be. But perhaps you are, wanna be very risk averse. You wanna make darn sure you're avoiding those high seas. Then you'd perhaps wanna use the 10% or even a 5%. So this would be a reasonable worst case for those giant waves to occur. So if that's your level of threshold for risk, then you'd have to avoid a larger chunk of the ocean in your ship routing. 
Another aspect is marine weather weekly briefings. So we're experimenting in-house and we may provide them publicly in the future of doing a once a week or twice a week briefing of, uh, of the conditions for our marine responsibilities. So I'm gonna play this. It may be a little hard to hear and I'm just gonna play about 30 seconds worth, but to give you a flavor of what we might be able to provide uh, going in the future as well. <laughs> That's ironic. Yes, this was recorded a few days ago and that did develop and that became Tropical Storm Faye. So that's one option as well, is to provide a, these live briefings uh, into the future <coughs> so that we can, uh, as, a, as another service to the marine community. So just to wrap up, we have 18 men and women here, all meteorologists that work 24 hours a day, uh, 365 days a year. Uh, right now we're working 10 hour shifts, so we're not on 24 hours a day for each person, but we keep, we try to help keep the mariner safe. And so we've got some incredible talented people to uh, to carry out our mission and to see we, where, where we can expand, provide new products and services. So thank you for your time today. Uh, I think I've got a little bit of time left over for, for questions if you have. I did wanna just make sure everybody knows our website that's available. So, for example, um, this shows for um, our marine forecast is just hurricanes.gov slash marine. And also, it's got uh, our phone number. So, you can, if you're a mariner and you're concerned about conditions, you can call us 24 hours a day and someone will pick up and talk to that forecaster about what's going on. We don't do ship routing per se, uh, but we're, we're happy to assist uh, if there's any emergencies. Uh, also, we're on Facebook and Twitter, and this uh, uh, presentation, as well as yesterday's, specifically on hurricane forecasting, will be available on YouTube and on our National Weather Service, National Hurricane Center YouTube website uh, within a week or so. But I think I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. Hi, Chris. Yes. Um, so Rick Villalobos asked, what are the requirements to become a boss reporting vessel? Well, you would need to meet with the port meteorologist, and there's one at uh, most major ports in the United States, and, uh, and the weather service can provide some equipment, and, uh, and basically it's, it's a commitment to providing that. Um, they are... Uh, they, in the past, the boss observations have had to have been done manually, um, but we are working to set a, an automatic observations to be sent out, which of course makes it easier for the mariners to work with. So if you go to that um, that boss page, um, in fact, I'll, I'll bring it back up here. Let's see if I can do that. I might not. Yes, I can. All right. It was just on the fourth or fifth slide. Right, there it is. So yes, so uh, www.vos.noaa.gov. Take a look at that and uh, it'll talk more about the VOS program and uh, can get you set up to provide observations um, for the National Weather Service. That'd be a wonderful thing to do. Okay, uh, David Disbrow asked, what's the best consumer worldwide wave and swell website? Well, the Weather Service, the Environmental Modeling Center, uh, has a website that does provide um, raw model output that you can either download or, or view on, on the internet. Um, with, uh, so that's one way. I don't know if I could give you the best. Certainly what we're providing on our marine composite page, uh, to me, is a, is a great way to see the winds and waves that way. Uh, and again, since we're running a wave model internally, uh, 
what we do is make sure that the hurricane winds are consistent with the wave forecasts that are coming out. And again, so that's that's available on our marine composite page. Uh, so I can uh, bring up that website again too. All right, more questions? Okay, this one is from Rick Carter. Um, I don't know if you can answer this, but uh, he asked, can you tell us which products uh, the team at Predict Wind in New Zealand utilizes for what they make available? I didn't know if you knew anything about what New Zealand does. No, I, I'm not familiar with that. I'm not sure if that's a governmental um, entity or, or a private company. Um, so I, I, I couldn't say. Um, Heather O'Malley asks, what if any collaboration is done with private ship routing companies? Right, so private ship routing companies um, hopefully are using our forecasts on a daily basis. Um, some of the uh, 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 shipping companies have land-based offices that help with the, the routing. Um, some shipping companies use uh, ship routing companies itself that help with their routing. Um, so on a daily basis, we don't interact uh, very much with individual ship companies or ship routing services. Um, but we're, as I, as I mentioned earlier, our phone is available 24 hours a day if anyone has any direct questions. Uh, we are trying to do more outreach with individual companies. So for example, I gave a talk at the uh, OSG's officers conference uh, about a month before the pandemic broke out and had a chance to talk with a lot of their captain and crew. Um, so we're trying to make more contacts with the marine community. Uh, in addition, we have a marine workshop that we host every March. And that was one week before the pandemic broke out. And at that marine workshop, we had uh, oil company represented. We had a couple cruise lines represented, a couple cargo ships. We had the Coast Guard represented. We had some of the maritime academies. And so, so if that's something that would be of interest uh, for your marine company to attend, um, please send me an email. Uh, I'd be happy to get you on the invitation list for our, our Mariners workshop that we host here in Miami at the National Hurricane Center in March. And there's my web, there's my email address. All right, uh, Kirk Hackler asked, he, he's living, he's currently in Mexico and he knows there are uh, surface wind wave charts provide, uh, prepared by us, but um, do you happen to know the link to access the forecast charts for the um, Mexican Pacific charts? Right, so I'm not familiar with uh, any uh, Mexican marine charts. Uh, they may make them from the, the, the National Weather Service of Mexico, um, but I, I just don't know. It. I, I've not, I've not seen those. I did want to mention one uh, product that related to that is that we are in the process of providing a Spanish language offshore zone. That's a potential new product as well. Obviously, there's thousands of smaller boats and fishing vessels and ferries. Uh, in the East Pacific and in the Caribbean Sea, where the primary language is Spanish. So we're in the process of taking our text formatter that automatically produces English out of our grids and seeing if we can make it do Spanish out of our grids. And so when we've discussed this with some of the Spanish speaking uh, weather services in the Caribbean, uh, they were pretty enthusiastic about it. So that would be another uh, potential service is a Spanish language offshore zone um, text forecast for the Caribbean, the Gulf, the West Atlantic, and East Pacific. Okay, um, Greg Carter asked if you could explain how the quadrants work in terms of the a forecast for hurricanes. And Certainly. Like in the, in, yeah, in the advisories. Okay, maybe I can pull up one picture of a hurricane. Yeah, so this is a good example here. So the the hurricane that's uh, just northeast of the Lesser Antilles, uh, you can kind of see that it it uh, it doesn't look really circular. It's actually got quadrants. So so the eye there, and then the northeast quadrant, uh, southeast quadrant, southwest quadrant, and northwest quadrant. So when when the hurricane specialists make a five day forecast, they're including the size, and they do it by quadrant. The reason they do it 
like that is that often we don't have a lot of detailed information about this, the exact size. And so we, instead, we, we do this fairly simplistic depiction of the four quadrants of how big are the hurricane force winds and how large are the tropical storm force winds. And so those forecasts go out through three days for the tropical storm force winds. And so it's, um, it's a fairly crude way to depict it, but because of our uh, limitations in knowing how big the hurricanes are today, um, that's, that's the way we've, uh, we've chosen to provide the information, quadrant-based winds, as well as we do quadrant-based uh, wave heights as well. Um, Lou Fincher asks, are there any comments on the sinking of El Faro? Hi, Lou, good to hear from you. So the El Faro was a, a horribly unfortunate disaster. Um, I'm not sure if I have a picture of El Faro, I do not. But it's, uh, it was a US flagged cargo ship going from Jacksonville to San Juan. And uh, they made the unfortunate decision to go right through Hurricane Joaquin in uh, 2015. And all 33 people on board drowned. And it was an unfortunate uh, incident. It was not an accident. It was, uh, it was bad decision making. And uh, there was a, a National Transportation Safety Board report about it, as well as a US Coast Guard Marine Board report in detail, very much in agreement that uh, it wasn't uh, the ship uh, falling apart, it was bad decision making. And so uh, we've learned from that and we're trying to provide more products and services to help the mariners out. Uh, one that, that I think may be of help is this uh, idea of wave height probabilities to show graphically where those giant waves could be. Um, and so the more information for the captain and crew, the better. Uh, but yes, it was a horrible disaster where all 33 people drowned because of bad decision making. Okay, um, Michael Gerstig, I'm sorry if I messed that up. Um, he asks, are there any discussions with MARAD Ma to correlate your weather information as it relates to the projected path of hurricanes with GPA AIS technology to send out notifications to ships? Certainly, that's a great question. So right now, uh, we are working to get our weather forecast information. And when I say we, that would also be the Ocean Prediction Center and the Honolulu Forecast Office. How do we get these wind and wave and warning informations to the bridge of a ship and they can overlay it on their navigation software, for example. And so that is a, a big holy grail for us. How do we get this information into AIS so they can uh, display it? Uh, one of the processes, ECTIS. Sorry, I don't remember the the, uh, the acronym. So there are efforts for that. It's, it's a long running process uh, and it may be a couple more years before it's available, but that's the idea. Instead of, you know, radio facts or text products, here would be a warning polygon that you can actually put on your navigation software that shows where, for example, the tropical storm conditions are and the hurricane conditions. So that is what the weather service is moving toward. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's a long running process, but we're we're very excited about that possibility to enhance safety for for mariners over the open ocean. All right, Lou has another question. Um, he asks, is there a way I could listen in on marina updates that are given in house at this time? Right. So. I had shown briefly uh, the example from Brad Reinhardt, one of our forecasters here, uh, a marine weekly uh, weather briefing. So we're still experimenting in-house. And uh, as you might imagine, the pandemics made it a little more challenging for all of us. And so we're, we're almost to the point where we'll provide these publicly, but we will send out a notification. We'll send out information about on Twitter, on the uh, National Hurricane Center Facebook, once we start providing them publicly. But, to me, it's another great way we can get the word out about wind and wave conditions and warnings over the next few days. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful we'll, we'll start making that available in the next couple of months, but uh, we'll, we'll have to see how things progress. 
All right, um, Lee Carlson uh, asks, what is the accuracy of 2448 72-hour forecasts and how accurate would the proposed longer range forecast be? Right, so weather forecasting in general is great the closer in time that you are. So a one day forecast is always better than a three, but better than a five, better than a seven. And our big events are winter storms where we have gales behind cold fronts, uh, big events are the Tawanapeckers in the uh, Pacific Ocean and the Gulf of Tawanapeck, and then, of course, tropical storms and hurricanes. So, um, what, whereas the winter storms tend to be large scale, uh, what we call synoptic on the scale of hundreds of miles, um, hurricanes tend to be pretty small uh, on the global weather side of things. So, for example, the average hurricane wind radii, the radius of hurricane force winds, is only about 30 or 40 miles across, especially in the low latitudes. And so if you get that forecast wrong, even by a little bit, both the winds and the waves are way off. So I can't give you any specific numbers, um, but if the track forecast is accurate of where the hurricane is going to go, our wind and wave forecasts are going to be pretty darn close. But because they're never perfect is the reason why we want to go to more probabilistic information. So again, we already have probabilities for hurricanes, uh, for the hurricane force winds and tropical storm force winds. So we're hoping to go to wave height probabilities as well to better provide the uncertainty information. Uh, and then the mariners can make most best use of that, depending on, again, how risk averse one might be. All right, um, David Disbrow asks to please describe the grid charts are for open oceans and how they are accessed. I don't know what rip charts are. So oh, grid, it's G R I B. G R I grib charts. Well, grib refers to the uh, the, the database itself, the, the gridded database. So that's a format. Um, of how the grids are provided and so uh, so i i can uh, if you go on our website uh, um, hurricanes.gov slash marine and then go to the gridded page uh, you can find out how to access the grids which are in grib format g-r-i-b uh, i'm not a technical person so I, I i will defer questions on on that but if you send me an email i will find out the answer for Greg Carter followed up with, um, if you can show one more time the public access web address for the TAPI offshore zones for the Mexican Pacific. You got it. And again, this will be available on the uh, Hurricane Center YouTube channel uh, within a few days. So uh, here's here's the offshore zones one for the uh, the Pacific. The uh, oops. And then um, do you actually have the link for the um, Pacific and Atlantic coast for the 24, 48, and 96 hour surface charts? I know we don't do 96, but I think you meant uh, 72. Here's the, here's the website. So let's put that, well, I'm sorry, what was the question again, Amanda? Oh, uh, sorry, um, can you provide the links for the 24, 48, and 72 hour surface charts for the Atlantic and Pacific? Do you have that readily available? I do. So the easiest way to get to that is just on our, our main web page here. So it's the uh, hurricanes.gov slash marine. That's the easiest way to get all of our products. Um, Carly Ann Johnson asked, um, given the increase in LEOS and other satellite technology for mariners, what do you see in the future for low bandwidth forecasts? Well, I'm hopeful that we can provide, uh, for example, um, information out through five days, surface progs, that would be included on our low bandwidth page. Um, I'm also hopeful that we can provide what's called a cumulative warning. That is over the next 48 hours, for example, where are the tropical storm winds going to occur and have that uh, show up both on the low bandwidth page as well as a GIS accessible shape file so the mariners can overlay that into their uh, uh, electronic charting display. I think that's what ECTAS does stand for. 
Uh, and so, yeah, so that's that's one of the things we're in development is how do we show not just a snapshot of where the warnings are, say, this morning or tomorrow morning at 12Z, but over the next two days, where is the cumulative area of the high seas uh, and high wind conditions? <laughs> Okay, and um, Kathleen Friel asked, has there been progress with North Wall event forecasting? So I think what's being referred to North Wall would be the, the Gulf Stream. And uh, most of that is outside our of our area. Um, I didn't say this before, but maybe I should have. Our area of responsibility ends at essentially Jacksonville. We go up to 31 north latitude in the Atlantic. And so North of that is the Ocean Prediction Center, and they'd have to deal with uh, the Gulf Stream and, and the north wall of the Gulf Stream. And so it's a challenge because right now our best ocean models are have difficulty in knowing not where the north wall of the Gulf Stream is going to be in a week, but even knowing where it is now. Uh, the oceanography forecasting is, is similar to the weather forecasting 50 years ago. Um, so they're they're challenged to try to provide good forecasts of, for example, the Gulf Stream location and, and strength um, when they don't have a lot of observations um, in the depths of the ocean. You really need that to have great, um, uh, to have good uh, ocean forecasts. And so that's coming along. There, there is a lot of efforts um, in NOAA to provide more uh, information about ocean currents ocean temperatures and salinities uh, in using gliders. So these unmanned uh, instruments that go up and down in the ocean. And so there's hope that uh, that more of those in com combination with uh, better ocean models should be able to help with the, uh, the north wall of the Gulf Stream. But it, it is a challenging um, forecast topic for, for meteorologists and oceanographers. All right, and last question. Uh, Greg Carter asks, um, how is the pandemic changing where we're working and how we're doing our job? Well, Amanda's working from home today. I'm working in the office today. We're, we're trying to socially distance. And part of that is to, uh, to set up facilities where we can uh, do the marine forecasting from home. Um, six months ago, uh, we did not even think that was possible. But when the pandemic hit, uh, we became very innov innovative so that we can keep our forecasters safe. Uh, and so right now, some of the forecasters, uh, uh, just a few work in the office and most are working from home. So we can limit our exposure and getting sick, but at the same time, not sacrificing our mission at all. We've not missed a single forecast product um, because of the pandemic. And so I'm very uh, proud of both facts that we're Everyone staying healthy in Taffy in the Hurricane Center, and we're getting our job done and keeping the Mariners safe. And that's it. Well, thanks everybody. If there's still anybody online, I appreciate your your time today, and hopefully this was of interest. Wow, there's still 70 people there. So thank you very much. Again, uh, feel free to send me a email if you have any follow up questions, and uh, I hope this was uh, of useful. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.